say I got it up to this point, but now what did you say? This is flipped learning because I'm recording this, and you can go back anytime you want to, 24-7 for the next 2,000 years or as long as the Internet exists and the world exists, and you can watch this presentation and go back and get that learning. You can rewind me if you want to. I can be in your home at midnight or you know, on a Saturday night with you. And so this is the great thing about um, the flip classroom is you can be at home with your kids at any time. Now I'm going to hit this button that says screen share and what that does is it looks crazy to us on this end doesn't look like anything but what it actually does is it's sharing the screen so that what your audience is seeing is what you're seeing. So if you're seeing this screen right now because I did that screen share it's not recording my face or the camera it's recording the um, the presentation, whatever I have. So if I have a PowerPoint, a worksheet, I want to show my class a website, I can do that very easily with Google Plus Hangouts. And here's just a little video, and hopefully my sound is going to work, about um, how Hangouts work. Oops, well, you know, the play button would work. Are you going to work for me? There we go. And let's see if our sound is going to work today. broadcast your Hangouts live to the world and record them as YouTube videos. To begin, click Start a Hangout. Invite people to join your Hangout. Name your Hangout and click Enable Hangouts on Air. Review and agree to the legal terms to continue. You only need to do this once. The first time you start a Hangout on Air, we'll ask you to link your YouTube account so we can record your topics to your YouTube channel. Okay. Click Hangout. Your Hangout will be... Oops. Well, darn it all, really. Again, but don't worry, you won't be broadcasting or recording just yet. Once you're in the Hangout, adjust your lighting and camera angles so you look your That's best. as loud as it's going to go. To stream your Hangout live on another website, simply copy and paste the link to embed your Hangout. When you're ready, click Start Broadcast. At this point, your Hangout is broadcasting live on your Google Plus profile, your YouTube account, and any website where you've embedded it. While you're broadcasting, your viewers will see everything you see in the Hangout, except for your chat conversations and the number of people who are watching your broadcast. You can mute people in your Hangout if their background is noisy, or click on a person's video to make the main screen stay on that person. When you're done, a recording of your Hangout will post publicly, so anyone who missed your live Hangout can still join in the fun. So go ahead, start your first Hangout on air today, and broadcast your conversation to the world. All right, so basically what you can do, <coughs> and I have this, um, where did it go? I have the Hangout going on. If I wanted to, I could have gone ahead and put that broadcast into um, a blog or a website or my wiki or Edmodo or whatever so that my classroom or anybody in the world could watch it live. Of course it's live right now on Google Plus Hangouts if somebody is looking there. So that's one way that you can flip your classroom and record easily what's going on. So let's look at what to flip classroom. So you have a traditional classroom where the teacher's role is to say on stage kind of this mess that I'm doing right now. <laughs> Which is not what I prefer. I don't like sit and get. I like where it's all interactive. And that's what the flipped classroom is. It's where the teacher's role is the guide on the side and it's student centered learning. <coughs> so let's think about the traditional classroom. When we think about traditional classroom, we see the desk in rows. All the students are the same age. They're all supposed to be learning the same thing because they're all ready to when they get that age, right? When they get that age, they're ready to all learn the same thing. No, not true. But that's what we did. And when this was designed in the early 20th century, it was designed based on the Henry Ford model. So we went out from the little one-room schoolhouses where you had students from, you know, five years old up to 15, 16 years old, all learning together at their own pace the way they needed to with that one-on-one -on -one teacher interaction and helping each other, to then being put into a Henry Ford model of learning and saying, when you reach this age, you'll be in this grade and you'll learn this information. We're going to sit in rows and we're going to pick the you out because everybody's the same, everybody learns the same, and they're ready to learn at the same time. Which 
for me, wasn't a good thing. I struggled with that. And this is what a traditional classroom looks like. And y'all might be familiar with this, so we might not. Y'all remember Ferris Bueller's Day Off? And the professor's up there talking, and the kids are sleeping in class. Have you ever seen that where the kids are sleeping in class? I've had kids do that in my classroom, and it's because I wasn't teaching effectively. I was doing boring. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, <laughs> anyone, anyone, the Tariff Bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. All right. So that's what people think about school and classrooms. And I've been in classrooms like that, and I've taught like that sometimes. But what the flipped classroom can bring you is so much more. And this is an example of the flipped classroom. And guys, I apologize for the sound. That's just as loud as I can get it. And I apologize. Oops. Honestly. Technology. Let's see if I can a little bit more up. Let's see. Oh, here we go. This is what a flipped classroom I'm Ernest Sams, and I teach science here at Woodland Park High School. My ultimate goal, I guess, as a teacher is to help students become learners who can learn for themselves and by themselves. One of the problems that I was guilty of even prior to flipping my classroom around was the classroom was centered around me. I told them exactly what to learn, how to learn it, what assignments to do to learn it, and when to learn it, and how to prove to me that they learned it. I don't do that anymore. You change the place in which content is delivered. Instead of standing in front of the class and delivering, here's how you do this type of problem, here's how this works, um, I deliver that direct instruction now asynchronously at home through these videos that we make with Camtasia Studio. Times till whole. Well, we didn't do that last The last time. step, they were already whole numbers. We had one, one, and four. Yeah. Here we don't have a whole number. So here's a few little tricks when you need to multiply by whole numbers. If one of your numbers ends in 0.5, you're going to multiply by two. Something 0.5 times it by 2. Right. Okay, write this down, guys. Yes. If something ends in 0.3 or 0.33 or 0.66, you multiply by 3. And when the kids come to class, they don't show up to learn new stuff. They show up to apply the, the things that they learn at home and to ask me questions about the things they learned at home. So now they can have my, my lesson, if you will, but I would normally have stood up and lectured to them in class with some added features, they get that at home, then what they were expected to do for uh, their homework is now what they do in my class. Life is different for me because I don't, I no longer am the guy who stands up in the front of the classroom and just yaks at a student for an hour, or what, however long the class is. Now, I walk around the class and I help kids. I, I'm a tutor, I'm a guide, I'm uh, the putter out of the fires, whatever it happens to be um, in my crazy chemistry class, I walk around and do that, I don't stand up front and teach under uh, the kind of a traditional model. I'm Aaron Sams. I'm a teacher. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. And I love Camtasia Studio. Hey guys, we live in such a exciting time. Um, we can do so many things that we couldn't do before. And we can make our classrooms transformative like what Aaron Sams and John Bergman have done in their classrooms and other teachers are doing across the nation in their classrooms as well. I actually got to meet John Bergman this year. Um, there he is right there. <coughs> I listened to him at the University of Montevallo talk about the 
classroom and how he and Aaron Sams got together and did this with classroom. And since then, I've learned so much because this is what a classroom is made to look like, even at the high school level where kids are interacting and they're working together. And this can be done employing the flipped classroom method. And with the flipped classroom, you don't start with the basics of remembering and getting basic facts. You start with them creating, discovering, and evaluating and analyzing the basic facts of that at home so that you can use your higher order thinking skills or your thoughts at, in the classroom and have time for those activities that you always say, well, I don't have time to do that because I have to get these basic facts <coughs> exhausted and fixed. But when you flip your classroom, you do have more time to do that. Now, a lot of people, you might read some negative things about flip classroom, and I think it's because they don't understand what a flipped classroom is. Yeah. Those people who are negative about the classroom think, well, it's just me recording my lecture and the kids are just sitting there and then they come to school the next day and I give them the worksheet that would have done their homework. That is not a good classroom. If they're sitting passively, that's not a good classroom. Good classroom is active and engaged. So you might record a short lecture, but they're not just sitting at home watching it passionately, passively if that's what it is. <coughs> it should be where they're actually doing something actively involved with that lecture or after they watch that lecture. It should have an active component. And it's not just for one-to-one -one schools or for students who have internet access at home. Really, the form of education is changing. Our school right now, the school that I work in, I work at Hoover High School in Hoover, Alabama, near Birmingham, we're having a discussion right now about virtual school. Florence City is already doing virtual school. Um, Education is changing. When I was at Auburn, I was on the new high school planning committee. And I thought, oh, great, we get to design a library and we get to say what the cafeteria looks like and what kind of desk. And it wasn't that at all when we were planning the new high school. The talk was about what is education going to look like in five years? What will it look like in 10 years? And do we need all this classroom space? And aren't we going to be teleconferencing? Won't there be distance learning? Want it be more a mix of virtual and online? Won't we have things that are more college-like, where you have office hours and certain class hours, but then other things are done off campus or on your own time? Flexible classroom workspace. I know that Montgomery just built a brand new high school, and there are no teacher desks inside of any of the classrooms. They have office space. Kind of like what Google does. Why does Google do that? Because they know that energy and power and creative ideas happen when you're interacting with each other, not shoveled away in your one little classroom with your four walls around you and your door closed. Right? So the way we teach is taking a dramatic change. We're going to have to examine what constitutes attendance. Because is it somebody's behind keeping a seat more, even if they're sound asleep in your class? Or is it what they're actually doing, whether they're in your class or virtually attending your class? And so these are all questions we have to answer and start adjusting to. And by doing the flip classroom, we're getting there. Because if you have that flip classroom, the kid can do that lesson without even being in your classroom. Also, the city of um, Decatur in Georgia was recently visited by President Obama. Why? Guys, the community stakeholders in Decatur, Georgia, decided they wanted charter schools, and they went 100% charter schools. Okay? That was the community stakeholders. Why? Because the charter schools have freedom to teach the classroom, to be innovative, to do things that are outside the bounds of what the state government says that we have to do or state education. That's why I vision. Iowa right now is looking at teaching kids at their own pace. So instead of saying, when you're five years old, you go in kindergarten, and you're going to learn the ABCs and your colors and your one, two, threes, you're going to learn where you need to be learning. I have a friend who's five-year-old, when she was four, read Charlotte's Web by herself, and then got on the computer and wrote an alternate ending. Well, when she turned five and went into kindergarten, do you think she needed to be learning her ABCs and one, two, threes? Heck no, she would have been bored to death. And they're struggling with her in a public school because they're not meeting the needs that she has for her child. Same thing for me. When I was in school, math was god-awful. Oh my gosh. 
I still have nightmare flashbacks from math class. But if I had had the flip classroom and I could have rewound that lesson as many times as I needed to, I probably could have gotten it and I wouldn't be so terrified of math to this day. And so there are states all over that are adjusting it, the way they teach, the way a classroom looks. So, flipping. What are the results of flipping? In one school in California who flipped, did their entire school, they went from, before they flipped, over 50% of the freshmen were failing English, 44% were failing math, and they had 736 discipline cases in just one semester. Yes, ma'am. Are we referring to the public school or This is a public school here. Mm -hmm. This is a public school that did the flip. After the flip, only 19% were failing English, only 13% were failing math, and their discipline cases dropped down to 249. Why? Because in a first classroom, kids are invested in their own They're engaged. And they feel cared about. Relationships are one of the number one factors of student success. If you can't have a relationship when you're up here talking at students. Okay? But also helps increase and helps work with your tier one and tier two students. Because you can have that targeted intervention, that on-time intervention with those kids, which is what they need. They need that relationship. They need to know your parent. They need to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction, which they can't have in a setting like what we're doing right now. It also helps with your um, rigor relevance model, so that you're working in quadrant A and D inside your classroom, and quadrant A and B are happening in the room. All right, so I'm going to tell you about a couple of teachers who are doing flipped classrooms. Trey Armstead is an Auburn High School graduate. He teaches physics at a public school. All these people I'm going to tell you about are public school unless I say otherwise. In Van Meter School, Iowa, regular kids, I always have people say, well, that's for the AP kids. Mm -hmm. It's actually really good for your regular kids and your lower kids, too. He uses Moodle as his learning management system. He's had over 800 educators from all over the world visit his classroom. He just started using Moodle four years ago. When he first split his classroom, it went okay, but he reviewed with his kids afterwards and he said, well, how did you like it? What did you think? He had some who loved it. He had others who were in. And then he had some who said, you know, I really just like the lecture method better. So the next year, he revamped the way he flipped his classroom. He put his entire physics course from beginning to end with every single lab, every single quiz, every single test on his Moodle page. He let his kids work through the way they wanted. Now, guys, my girls, I have twin daughters, they start working the day they turn 16. They didn't get off work till 11 o'clock at night, and then they're going to have to do homework. Well, for a lot of people, they can't do that, or they don't have computers or internet at home. So what he did is, if you had computers and internet at home and you wanted to work on your own, you could do that. If you didn't, he had computers or devices set up in the back of his classroom. If the kids wanted to work on their own, but they didn't have devices or they played sports after school or worked after school or whatever, they could go to the back of his classroom, put on the headphones, and work through his lessons at their own pace. Then he had some kids who wanted that one-on-one -on -one lecture experience, so he had them up in the front of the class and worked with them in the one-to-one -one lecture had those working. Why did this work well for him? The kids loved it. He had some kids who finished his entire physics course in three weeks. Okay? Those kids didn't need to spend an entire semester in that class to get that work and successfully master it. They proved mastery in three weeks. They were able to go on and take online classes that they wouldn't have the ability to take if they had to waste their time sitting in a classroom an entire semester. And those kids, let me tell you, your gifted kids cause just as much problems yeah. as your not gifted oh, yeah. kids because oh, yeah. they're full, yeah. right? Yeah. But these kids didn't because they were engaged and they were able to move on to something more challenging for them. For the ones who weren't the gifted kids and needed more help, they could sit there and watch this lesson over and over as many times as they wanted and nobody knew. Johnny had to watch the lesson 10 times before he got it. Nobody knew Johnny wasn't that smart because Johnny was still getting the grades because he could learn at his own pace. Right? Yes? If I can say that I'll never leave, I'll have Johnny. Okay, so if the student finished early, I'm 
and you have to follow state guidelines of the court unless you are advocating <coughs> us trying to get charter schools to implement the classrooms. I, I, I'm not understanding. So this takes place in private and in, in not private, in public schools. And Tommy Bice is giving permission to schools if they say this is what we want to do. He's giving permissions to do that. That's how Florence City is doing virtual school. That's how we're doing with classroom and Hoover City School. That's how other people are doing that. So you have permissions to do that. And as long as the kids are mastering that, you don't have a problem. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, how do you feel with it's perfect for that because it's active and engaged. Active and engaged. They're not sitting passively. Like right now, if I were sitting where you are, I'd be fidgeting. Okay? Yes. Well, I would have a different set. Could you say something about the grading and how you do that with the mandatory amount of grades you have to have in by this yeah. time, this time, this time? That's something you have to work out with your administrator. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's something you have to work out with your administrator. But I'm telling you, you want what's best for children. This is proven to work, and it's something to try. And you can do this, and you can still get your grades in. It's a matter of adjusting the way you teach and what you do. Okay? Um, Julie Ramsey is a teacher in Alabama. She was one of the Sweet 16 teachers um, for Teacher of the Year this year. She wrote a book called Can We Skip Lunch and Keep Writing with the Fifth Grade Students. She and her fifth grade students are flowing out every year by ISTE to present at the ISTE conference, and she teaches her classroom this way. When she gets ready to teach a certain concept, she doesn't say, all right, kids, we're going to learn this, and this is how we're going to learn it, and this is the project we're going to do, these are the activities we're going to do, and this is how I'm going to grade it. She says, this is what we need to learn. This is our objective. How are we going to learn it? And her students create the lesson. Her students create the grading, grading rubrics. Her students do the grading based on the rubrics they created. It is completely student-centered. She doesn't design the lessons. She doesn't choose the technology they're going to use. They choose it. That way they have ownership of that lesson. And her kids are on board. And she has from autism students to ADHD students to special education students the gifted students all in her fifth grade classroom, but it works for all of them because they're allowed to learn at their own pace, in their own way, in their own time. And that's what flipping the classroom does. If you haven't read her book, it's amazing. It can take you step by step through how to do a flipped classroom. And even though it's for grades three through eight, it can easily be adapted to lower or higher grade students. And she's up to the speaker and presenter, so if you ever can see her, please do. Uh, a friend of mine worked at a private school in Columbus, Georgia, where at the private school they still were able to meet the state guidelines, but everyone there worked at their own pace. They had a social studies classroom. You could be ninth grade social studies, or twelfth grade social studies. You worked at your own pace. When you earned that credit, you got that credit and moved on to the next thing. If it took you a day to earn that credit or a year to earn that credit, that was up to you. The day they finished all their credits in order to graduate, they graduated that day. They would go into her office because she was the principal of the school. She'd go in, they'd go into their office. I finished all my credits. She'd pull out a diploma, sign it. Congratulations, she graduated. Where is it? Okay. Where is it? Columbus, Georgia. In Columbus? At a private school. Oh, yeah. That's a private school. Right? But, but with what's happening and the discussion that we're having in my school district right now, with virtual classrooms, these things are going to be happening in the public sector as well. <coughs> How they're going to happen needs to be worked out. <coughs> this is where education is heading, and it's exciting. Now, I've noticed we've got a bunch of these buttons in the room. We've 
We've already had some big bets. Big up. So let's look at some of the big bets we haven't heard about yet. What about standardized testing? We got to teach these babies how to fill in the bubbles. Let me tell you, every single study of flipped classrooms, the kids score phenomenally better on standardized tests than in a regular classroom or in your traditional classroom. Yes. <coughs> guide on the side to make sure that doesn't happen and that they're following what they're doing and that you're modeling and helping them through that process. But every study done has shown kids perform better on standardized tests when you don't teach to the test, you Amen. teach the subject and let the material absorb that information and they actually do learn it better. So I understand those babies don't bubble in, they're not listening half the time. But I'm telling you, flip classroom works if you try it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there were some in the back, but I don't know if there's any more. No, but I can see it out. Alright, here's another big but. My kids don't have access to technology. They don't have access to the internet. Well, guys, I've been teaching 22 years. I was in school before the internet existed. Okay? When I had to do a research paper for my teacher, I had to use what? Encyclopedia. Oh, teacher, my family doesn't have encyclopedia at home. I'm sorry, you're going to have to adjust your entire lesson because my family doesn't have access to encyclopedias at home. What would your teacher have said to you? Right. Is that an excuse? Was that an acceptable excuse to your teachers that I don't have a set of encyclopedias at my house? The encyclopedias today are the internet. Okay? So why are we accepting that excuse today? In my library, we stay open. We open early. We close late. They have access to the computers. There's public library. We check out laptops to kids overnight. They can sit at McDonald's to get free Wi-Fi. There is a way to do it, just like there was a way for us to get encyclopedias to do the research papers our, our teachers wanted us to do. That's a cop out, not an excuse, not a reason they can't do that. Really, really, that's not a cop out. You gotta realize that some of the areas that you were talking about, that there are some uh, uh, kids that are not really challenged to learn the material. That they have to go to those places that you're talking about. The bus ride and then home. Right. Yes, ma'am. And I've worked in places. And so and we've adjusted and we've been able to provide opportunities, even if it's like Trey Armstead did in the back of his classroom, tools for them to use or computers for them to use. And we're going to look at a school where they don't have technology and are still using flipped classroom. So how, how would they use I mean, how would they do that if they don't have them? I mean, you're watching videos at home. Right. I'm going to show you. How they do that. Okay. All right. I don't have enough time for flip class in front of the class talking. Your time is actively involved with the kids. Okay. Did I just understand you to say that you're going to look at the class, the schools, or a classroom where they do not have the technology using flip classroom 
Yeah. We're going to look at a class where they aren't using any technology at all. And flip but they have the flipped classroom. Right, but they have. Okay. They have I'm some not access. interested in that. Okay. <laughs> all right, another thing. Another thing that I'm here. Hey, guys, you know what? It is easy to stop or something. Before the first man was on the moon, people stopped and people just said we could put a man on the moon. Okay? It's easy to sit here and say, well, and you can come up with a hundred reasons why you shouldn't do something. Yeah. But you know what? Until you give it a chance, until you try it, you don't really know. Right. And I'm telling you, this part, let me tell you about this. I know it works. I'm telling you, I'm connected with educators all over the world who are doing this, and the phenomenal educators and the kids are better off for it. Okay? And I'll take questions in just a minute. Okay? Alright, one thing. Guys, I've been teaching kids for 22 years. I had teenagers that grown up. Guess what? When you have kids, you look dumb no matter what, even if you're the smartest person on the face of the earth. And right now, it's letting your kids take control, take ownership, and teach you stuff. Say, do you know a technology that we could use to learn this? Yeah, let me show you. How important does that make those kids feel to show the teacher how to do something and empower them? I'm talking about empowering kids. This is what the flip classroom does. Yes, it keeps, you know, if you keep saying the traditional classroom, not empowering them, what's it doing to your self-esteem? What classroom builds their self-esteem? They can learn on their own. I've had teachers tell me, well, why should I learn how to do this now? Because I'm just going to have to learn something new later. Really? Are you going to accept that for your kids? I've had teachers tell me this. What if your kids sit in the classroom? Well, teacher, why should I learn this from you? Because next year I'm just going to have to learn something different. I've had teachers tell me this. All right. What about my administrators? And what about my parents who don't understand the classroom? Guess what? When I was a sixth grade teacher, I taught math the way I needed to be taught math, which was interactive. I never had a kid, even when I had special ed students, ADHD students, autistic students, nobody ever made below a C in my math classroom. Because I taught the way I wish I had been taught, I was scared to death of math. I failed math classes all throughout school because I had the teacher who would go up to the board. She'd show you how to do the problem, say, okay, now open your book up to page 50, do the 100 problems, odd problems, and she'd sit at her desk. I had lost her in step two, people. And then when I opened up that book and I saw all those problems, it broke me. And then I went up to the teacher's desk and said, I don't understand. What do you mean you don't understand? I just stood up there on the floor and showed you how to do it. Weren't you paying attention? Well, yeah, but by the time you got to step two, I didn't know what you did in step one to get to step two, and then I could pay attention to the rest of it. But if you had flipped your classroom, I could have rewound you a hundred times until I got it. And then I wouldn't have felt like an idiot in the classroom. Okay? Empower students. To this day, if I get put in a math classroom, I feel like crying. It hurts me to be in that classroom. Alright? I taught math. I had an administrator come in and evaluate me and give me the worst evaluation I've ever had in my entire teaching career because my kids were actively learning. And this is what my administrator said to me. You're not teaching the math the way you're supposed to. The kids should be sitting down at their desk with their books open and you should be at the board. I said, oh, no, it's not happening. <laughs> and I'm not going to hurt children the way I was hurt. And that was before technology, before I could do the flip classroom. I still had my children involved and actively engaged and not sitting them with the textbook open. Okay? Advanced Ed is a new SAS. I was just on an external review team. Let me tell you, you can, oh no, this ain't going to work all you want. But when I was on the external review team, external, uh, doing accreditation review, guess what we looked for in the classroom? Oh, the classroom. Yeah. If you are standing up in front of your class doing what I'm doing right now, guess what? Oh, okay. 
<laughs> if you're the only person touching that smart board, guess what? <laughs> if it's not an active, engaged classroom, your kids are sitting passively in their desk, guess what? <laughs> the district I observed, I don't know if they're going to keep their accreditation. Because there wasn't a single teacher from kindergarten to high school that wasn't standing in front of the classroom and yakking at the kids. Okay? I'm telling you, you might not want to do it, but when you come around to your status accreditation review, if your classrooms aren't doing it, <laughs> when that review comes around because they were shot. I was scared to be in that board meeting when we told them our results. I made sure I parked my car way up so that as soon as we were done I could jet out of there and I knew I had my gas tank already filled because I did not want to stop in that town because I knew they were going to be mad because we didn't see active involved classrooms. We saw traditional classrooms, and that's not what they're looking for anymore. And with Common Core, if you want to get Common Core, it's active involved classrooms. Okay? That's how you get this, is split classrooms. No, my class has changed. It's from the student point of view. When they come in and evaluate you for a, accreditation, it's student point of view. If I were a student in this classroom, how would it look? That's what they're evaluating. All right, then this summer I attended AETC and I listened to Kevin Honeycutt. Were any of you at AETC, the Alabama Educational Technology Conference? He was amazing. Um, he talked for like an hour and a half. Sometimes I'll, I'll sit at home and watch his video and it makes me cry every time. But this is one thing I love about Flip Classroom, what he's talking about here. And Kevin Honeycutt, by the way, works with um, juvenile offenders who are incarcerated. All right, come on. And he talks about team teaching with yourself. So while this is spinning, I'll tell you a little bit about that team teaching with yourself. Think about this. Doing this and you'll start thinking different. You people, raise your hand if you're flipping your classroom. Really? Yeah. 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 Like you could wish you could clone yourself? All right. Well. What Kevin Honeycutt says is if you record your lesson, and I wish this would play because he really does a better job at it than I do, um, if you could record yourself and your kid comes up to you and says, hey, I don't understand what you did in step two, blah, 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 you can say, okay, here, here's this iPod or here's this uh, You're doing this and you'll start iPad. thinking different. You people, raise your hand if you flip. Here's this iPad. Take that, put your headphones in, go back, watch it again. If you have questions, come back and ask me. So you're still available to go talk and teach other kids, and you're actually teaching this kid too, all right? And so you're actually team teaching with yourself is what he's saying here. But one other thing that he says in this presentation is... Flip in your classroom. Flip in your classroom. I love you guys. You know what you're also doing? Making rewindable learning. See, not every kid gets it. You ever, you ever see a kid and you know they didn't get it, but they won't tell you? And you check in and you say, you understand, right? And he goes... All right, and he says, <laughs> so, and the kid says, yeah, of course I understand. But you know he doesn't, and you're not rewindable. See, I don't want to be stupid, but not in front of everyone, please, please. You know, you understand, right, Kevin? In front of everybody? Are you kidding me? But if I go home and watch you on my Android phone, I'll rewind you three, four times. I don't want to be stupid, but I can't do that. Archives. I'll start archiving. Start with the trip over lessons, the ones they trip over, the ones they ask you four or five times, you know what I mean? Because if you can, you can do that. Start with those trip over lessons. Because the kids don't want to feel stupid. Like I yeah, don't you don't to have to indict stupid. them with an exhalation. We do this. We don't mean to, but we do. She comes up to your desk, you go. 
So the kids don't want to feel stupid. They can't help but they can't learn as fast as the others. Okay? So what you're doing when you're flipping the classroom is you're empowering those kids to be able to learn at their own pace, not feel stupid in front of you. Plus, you get to clone yourself as well. Right, I understand that, and I'm going to show you a couple of resources you can use because that's true. Maybe somebody else can say it better than you. Maybe you can't get a prize, but maybe a kid can make an explanation. They can teach it, you know, they got it, they understand it. So that's something else. This is also really cool. Flip writing of your papers. This is called Canthia. And you can actually record yourself grading the papers. You've got to grade the paper anyway. And so you can record yourself grading the paper, highlighting, making the corrections, and talking. And you can actually have one-on-one -on -one conferences with every single kid in your class at the same time. They can all put in their headphones look at their device, play a video of you grading their paper and walking them through that essay or that research paper where you're highlighting and grading and correcting it. So you're talking to the kid as if they're in the room when you're grading the paper and recording that. So this is a really good um, feedback. Now this is Ms. Kirsch. Yeah. All right, it, um, it's like a D E N A. Right? And there's a great video on there walking through how to do it, and it works through Google. So if you're Google EDU school, it's just perfect for that. But I'm going to show you Ms. Hirsch is the most awesome flipper I've ever met. And I'm going to take you through how she flips her classroom because it's pretty awesome. They use dry erase boards, people, to, in, their, in her flip classroom. And it's really kind of awesome. And somebody said, oh, this must be an AP class. It's not. It's regular A class. Come on, Ms. Kirsch. <laughs> and our internet seems to be really slow today. I apologize. So I'm going to let that have time to come up. I'm going to let Ms. Kirsch have time to come up, and we'll come back to her in just a minute if my internet hasn't completely. Well. And yeah, my internet is slowing down on me. All right. So guys, one of the reasons, I'm trying to get Ms. Kirsch to get started back up here, so we're going to just do this for a minute while we get Ms. Kirsch up here. We're teaching kids information they need to know for jobs that don't even exist yet. So what we have to do is teach them how to learn. If we're the ones giving them all the information, we haven't empowered them to be self-learners or lifelong learners. And guys, we have to model lifelong learning for our kids. We're educators. We should be the epitome of lifelong learners. We should want to learn new things. I feel like I've wasted a day if I haven't learned something new every single day, no matter how small or big it is. When I come across something new, I'm so excited, just like a little kid learning something for the first time. But illiterate isn't going to be the person who can't read. It's going to be the person who doesn't know how to learn for themselves. And we've got to empower the kids to know how to investigate and learn for themselves instead of spoon-feeding them information. <laughs> It's going to start one bite at a time. I never advise you to go in and try to flip your entire semester, your entire year. That's crazy. That's like trying to eat an elephant in one bite. I always say, flip one lesson with one class. Try it, see how it goes, work out the kinks, and then try it again. And try it with a different class. Try it with a different lesson. Do it one thing at a time. When I want technology unblocked at my school, well, it's all unblocked at Hoover right now, but when I was at schools that 
uh, blocked it. Like if I wanted to use Twitter with a class for formative assessment, which is a great formative assessment tool Twitter is, I would say, okay, well, can you unblock it for this one hour for me to use with this one class for this one lesson and here's my objective and why I need to do it. Then they would unblock it for that one hour for that one class. Well then the kids will start talking about how much they loved it. They'll, they're talking, other teachers hear about it. Then other teachers say, well, could you unblock it for me? Could you unblock it for me? Could you and then it becomes this tidal wave until it was finally unblocked. Do you see what I'm saying? But you got to start, well, can I have permission to do this just once with this one class or with this one lesson? There's tools out here you can use. Now, John Bergman and Aaron Sams to record these Camtasia Studios, but that's like two or three hundred dollars. I use Google Plus Hangouts, like I showed you earlier. That's absolutely free. All you need is a Google account, and you can get a Google account with your Yahoo address, whatever you want. You don't have to necessarily have a Gmail account. It's very simple and easy to use. Um, Gene is free online too, but I think it only does like five minute videos. I swear by Google Hangout. My teachers have used. Um, smart board reporters, but once I showed them how to do Google Hangouts, they said, ah, why didn't I know about Google Hangouts? I've been using a smart board reporter, and it's so much harder to use than Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts is very easy to use, so you can record with that. And guys, you don't have to do all the recording yourself, because sometimes somebody else can say it better than you can, or get it through to the kid better than you can. Um, you can use TED Talks. If you don't know about TED Talks, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And you've got TED Ed, which flips lessons for you already. So you don't have to create all your own flip lessons. You can use those. So there's lots of other flip classroom resources that you can use as well. And let me see if Ms. Kirsch is ready yet. All right. So there's other resources you can use. I'm going to show you how to use Blend Space. <coughs> which used to be Ed Canvas. And I'd also recommend Khan Academy. If you're not familiar with Khan Academy, it's math based, but they also have videos in there for all sorts of other subjects. But it's awesome for math. And I'm thinking about going back and using Khan Academy and teaching myself math now. All right, so Ms. Kirsch. She's in California, and this is how she does her classroom. So with the flipped classroom, the responsibility for the learning goes from being you, the teacher, to the students. It's the student's responsibility to learn, which is what they need to be lifelong learners. Guys, if we're getting them college and career ready, how are we getting them college and career ready where they have to be responsible for their own learning if we're doing it all for them? All right? Your face-to-face -face time goes from teacher to student focus, and the... Um, Classroom time is student focus, not teacher focus. And it's higher order thinking skills. And Ms. Kirsch calls those her HOTs. Okay? So,
or at the library or at McDonald's or wherever they can get that connection. They organize that content is organized online. Sophia, that's what she uses, as well as making her own videos, which we can't see. All right, she gives her kids what's called a student success pack or sheet that takes them through everything they're going to be learning in that unit. So again, that's right there on paper. I'll, to, I'll 